Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to Around the Peninsula. Today we're in San Pedro and we're going to step inside LA County's largest boys and girls club. This is one of 20 sites operated by the Boys and Girls Club of the Los Angeles Harbor. The organization is a private nonprofit serving thousands of at-risk youths daily. Of course, the operation had to close down during the pandemic, but they are reopening their doors, signing kids up for summer camp and excited to bring back on the many programs that serve our community. I'm excited to come because I'm excited to do the online like summer camp. I'm looking forward to is that I hope there's lots of games and then there's like um, they we're doing art and all those other stuff that they usually have there. Love is really really good because it develops the kids social skills and they became more mature to handle themselves and responsible how to behave with other kids like social skills is more important and some combination of all the knowledge science math and everything that you need to learn aside from the regular schooling but it's not really like too much of a pressure it's just like more fun learning in here and as mom after dealing with the pandemic and the kids were home from school you're probably ready for summer camp yes <laughs> yes and then my son is always praying that when we're going to be the pandemic we're going to be over because he said like i need to get to see my friends all right ella you're going into the fourth grade and you're coming back for summer camp what are you excited for uh reading Reading, and you want to be a future congresswoman. Why do you want to run for Congress one day? I love this. Uh, I have no idea. Do you think you can make a difference? Yeah. I can make a difference. About people littering, they could just throw in the trash. Mike Lansing, Executive Director, uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of the Los Angeles Harbor. Here in my home club, here at the San Pedro Club, I went to this club uh, back in the late 60s, played basketball in this gym. Uh, lots of great memories and uh, uh, great to be here with you today, Liz. So thank you for stopping by. And of course we're here because you're back. I mean, summer camp is kicking in. Uh, we're in the gym and kids are coming with families to pick up and sign up. And so just kind of talk about how you are getting your programs back and going. Of course, you were shut down during the pandemic. Sure. Yes. You know, we, we obviously we closed with the stay at home order uh, of the pandemic and we've been doing virtual programming since then, as well as food distribution at seven sites uh, as a little bit of a pivot. Uh, now we're, we're excited about opening up. Uh, next week, we will be doing two weeks of live um, virtual programming. And then starting in early July, Monday, July 6th, we will start having kids back in our seven uh, traditional club locations, so we're excited about that. So talk about the programs that will be offered now that you're reopening again, and also just sort of the safety protocols that you're going to have to follow because of COVID. Obviously, all your staff is here wearing masks and sure. wiping down, and you're not wearing a mask because we're, we're social distancing yeah, right now, sure. physical distancing, but kind of share about what, what's going to happen that way. Sure. Um, so, you know, we're, we've been in contact with uh, L.A. County, uh, with Dr. You know, Ferrer and her team, uh, one of my... Uh, past students when I was teaching is part of her task force. So I get direct information on a regular basis. Following all the protocols, you know, we're gonna stay at 10 to one, even though we could be a little bit larger pods of, of youth. So they'll be together in a pod. Um, they will not be interacting with other groups of kids. They'll have their own team, we're calling them, instead of a pod. And they are uh, be going from one activity to another. Um, we'll be having academics, fine arts, STEM, recreation, where luckily we have this gym and we have Daniel's Field across the street, so kids will be able to get outside and do things inside. Um, we're gonna have you know, lunch every day and snack later in the day. Kind of a warm up um, to getting the club open again for the school year, which will be even a, a larger effort um, as kids go back to school and they'll probably be only going back to school two days a week. So we're looking to be a full day Boys and Girls Club during the school year for the first time ever so we can provide those activities um, when kids aren't in the classroom. I know this club has come a long way since you first started here. We're going to go into that. Right now you're operating 20 sites. You've got like 2,600 kids you serve normally daily. Um, when the pandemic hit, what happened? How, what was the impact um, on everybody you, you serve? Sure. Well, you know, obviously um, things were coming out that, you know, the school district was thinking of closing. We were a little bit ahead of the curve. We started bringing a Tiger team together to talk about what if. Matter of fact, Friday, um, Friday, March 13th, when LUSD made the announcement 
they were closing. We were having a Tiger team meeting that morning to talk about how we were going to transition. Um, so we go, we're going to have to close our sites. Um, but we have kids that need our services and direct impact. So we went, you know, in two weeks we had our virtual programming up and running. Uh, within two weeks we had our first food distribution center because we knew a lot of our families were going to be in dire need of food. So many families have their children fed at school and at the club. So when you close those, you know, uh, families are really in great need of food assistance. And then lastly, we kept our college bound program going. Uh, all that staff continued to work with their members, uh, especially with high school seniors who are about to graduate, need to finish their college pathway um, applications, picking the right schools, getting the funding package, scholarships. Um, so we continued that through the 12, last 12 weeks, which for those students, they had no counselors they could connect with at school. Our college bound case managers were it. So uh, it was great to be able to continue that service even while we were closed per se and, and the schools were closed. I want to focus a little bit on the history and the mission um, of, of the Boys and Girls Club of the LA Harbor here. 1937 is the first club that opened in San Pedro. Talk about the goals and the mission. Well, back in the day when they started the club, um, it actually was started by the Civitans who um, other business owners were talking about, we need to get these boys off the streets. <laughs> They're causing trouble in the downtown. Uh, retail district, uh, they're scaring away customers. We gotta get them off the streets and into a place where they can run off some of that energy without uh, being <laughs> destructive. So the first club was in a Quonset hut, I believe on 9th Street. And then uh, approximately five years later, early 40s, uh, they transferred to this location. It was the original San Pedro High School location, which was condemned after the I believe it was the 22 uh, earthquake mm -hmm. um, and it had been kind of sitting fallow. So uh, the city allowed the, the Boys and Girls Club to move into this space. Uh, this building wasn't here at that time. It was the old high school. Um, and then in 1965, this building was uh, erected and I was at the club at that time. So I went from the old broken down high school building to come into a brand new Boys and Girls Club in 1965. This gym was brand spanking new at that time and it was, uh, it was a great opportunity for us boys. It was still a boys club in 1965. And then the girls, they finally smartened up and let us girls come in in, in the 1990s, you said, right? Correct, 1993 <laughs> to be exact. I was on the board of the club and uh, we said, look, we've got that. girls are here. We've got to make it a Boys and Girls Club. So we finally got our act together in 93 and became the at that point, the San Pedro Boys and Girls Club, because this was our only location at that time. Our goal is to provide, uh, first of all, we want to serve the kids who need us the most. Any child can come here, but we keep our fees to almost zero um, so that anybody can come. Uh, and then our second goal is providing them with the same experiences, you know, to make an analogy that a kid up on the hill might get. So we want to make our programming comprehensive making sure they get all the things that their parents and families can't afford, whether it's academic support, engagement in the arts, recreation and sports, STEM, leadership development, food. Uh, we want to make sure that the kids here have the same opportunities and growth um, pathways that, you know, their more affluent peers are provided. And I had been a teacher for seven, an educator for 17 years. So when I came here, you know, I said, we need to provide more academic support and after a few years and after building a teen center, we, we noticed that we're, our kids were still struggling. So we felt we had to do more on the academic side. And so we built our college bound program to really provide a pathway. And while we were doing that, um, providing that one-on-one -on -one assistance and all the resources that we provide in college bound, we felt that it was, you know, the arts were another area that the kids weren't getting. Um, access to other than looking at art or listening to art. So we built out, you know, a fine arts center, we built out a dance center, we built out music centers, a recording studio here. Um, we ended up um, making the club into three clubs within a club, mm -hmm. elementary, middle school, and high school. So we separated by age groups to attract more kids. And then we built a new um, sports arena across the street. It was strategically we put that together. So. You know, we call it pushing the envelope. 
We wanted to push in all directions to maximize space and opportunities. It's kind of been our mantra for the last 25 years and it's helped us serve so many more uh, youth today than we than we did back in the day. You say pushing the envelope. I think you've signed it, sealed it, and you're definitely <laughs> delivering here. Thank I want to go back to your story a little bit. You know, you said you were a teacher. You also were a club kid. Um, but just how you ended up here and how long you've been here and how you've grown this program. Yeah, so I am, um, I was, uh, like I said, I went to the club uh, probably 63 through 69, 70 when I was a kid. Played bitty basketball here, played Little League. Uh, baseball in the back. Um, it was a great place for a boy to go after school in the summer when we didn't have other activities keep us engaged. And um, as I grew up and started my professional career teaching education, I was asked to come back and be a board member. Um, I was planning to be a school administrator. I was already a, an assistant principal, athletic director, uh, both at uh, K through eight school, then at Mary Star the City High School. I had just gotten my master's in school administration when the position of executive director opened up. Ray Martinez was the executive director at that time. He had happened to be one of my coaches when I was a kid here, and you know, he said, Mike, you should, you should really think about applying for this position. Uh, I had started the San Pedro Youth Coalition, so I had been involved in some nonprofit work and, and doing some different things. And uh, you know, I was, I was most fortunate to apply and get that position uh, back in 1995. So I've, I've been here 25 years now. Um, you know, it's, it's been just, a, it's been a, a, you know, a godsend for me and it's been a, a great experience. Uh, we, we decided to ramp it up a notch, um, had a great board, said, look, we're gonna build teens, we're gonna make teens the, a priority because nobody's serving teens. Teens have nowhere to go. Once they get to high school as a society, we kind of say, okay, you're on your own now, stay out of trouble. Um, we felt that we need to be much more engaged. So, you know, we felt serving teens was important. Then we felt we needed to get outside of our space and look to open up a second location. And we did down by Rancho San Pedro with the Port of Los Angeles. We built mm -hmm. our second site. Then in 2003, the Wilmington Club was about to close their doors and their board came to us and said, would you consider merging? And which meant basically taking them over and, and figuring out a way to raise the money, and we did. So we became the Boys and Girls Clubs of the LA Harbor. <laughs> we added 12 school sites. Uh, two years ago, the South Bay Boys and Girls Clubs was about to fold, and their clubs were in Harbor City and Harbor Gateway. And so we said, okay, either we let them close or we take that on. And um, so we added those clubs. And then just this last year, we added Harbor Hills Public Housing up here on PV Drive North and Western. We added that as our 20th location. And you've become the biggest boys and girls club in LA County, is that right? Correct. Uh, size, budget, number of youth served, we, uh, we've, uh, we've become the largest uh, club in, in the county. And since you brought up budget, I wanted to shift now to the funding, how you get funded. I think you said when you started, maybe it was a couple hundred thousand dollars to run the operation. Now you're close to nine million. So. Yeah. Uh, you're the gift that keeps giving. <laughs> yeah, we, um, you know, it, it, you, you can't, you know, ideas are great, but if you can't fund ideas, they're just good ideas. Um, so we've really grown our budget from 270000 back in 95. Uh, we just had a finance committee meeting today where we're recommending a $9.3 million budget next year. Um, you know, the demand keeps getting bigger, um, and now we're going to be looking at full day programming during the school year when we're normally just after school, we're going to be full day so parents can send their kids to a clubhouse when they need to go to work and the kids aren't in school because they'll only be in school two mm -hmm. days a week probably. So, you know, we're really reliant on a growing uh, reliance on individual donors. We've been very fortunate that people from the peninsula have been growing um, members or investors, we like to call it, in the kids we serve. Mm -hmm. And so we're continually trying to build uh, the number of individual donors we have. Local family foundations have been very supportive. Um, and we need to keep reaching out as, you know, we keep growing. So it's, it's, it's really a um, combination of foundations, individual donors, businesses and corporations. Um, some government funding. As we sit here in the, the gymnasium, I see the LeBron James Family Foundation, obviously then a donor believing in what you do. 
celebrities, you've had famous uh, graduates from your program here. T share some of the some of the famous folks that have come through the uh, the club here in San Pedro. Yeah, I mean, when I went to the club, it was all sports. Um, <laughs> so some of the alumni back then, I went, I played basketball. Well, I say I played basketball with him, but actually I watched him play. He was so much better. Uh, Bobby Gross was a, a great athlete, uh, went on Long Beach State and then played for the uh, world champion Portland Trailblazers with Bill Walton. Um, you had people like Joe Amapatano, Willie Knowles, who recently just passed away, uh, professional athletes. So early on it was all sports. Then you have people like uh, Major General Peter Gravitt, one of, I believe, 12 children in a family here living in Rancho San Pedro. He came to the club and he went on to become uh, the first African-American Major General uh, in the Army. Uh, retired now. He was also the Secretary of Veterans Affairs under um, uh, Governor Brown. So uh, he's had an amazing uh, life and impact. Um, two years after I started here, this little girl came up to me. She must have been four foot ten, weighed about 70 pounds. <laughs> said she wanted to, uh, her and her girlfriends wanted to um, do some dancing moves and practice back in the back room. I said, okay, you can have the room, but you got to keep the boys out. Um, one day my staff came to me and said, you know, she's really good. Um, you really should think about maybe we do, you talked about maybe doing a dance program. Now's the time. So I uh, contacted Cindy Bradley at the uh, San Pedro Ballet Center. I said, I'd like you to I'd like to pay you to come and teach ballet for my kids up at the club, close the gym off. Kids got to do ballet uh, once or twice a week. And after about two months, she said, you know, this girl, Misty Copeland, she's, um, she's special. Um, I think I'd like to see, I'd like to scholarship her and have her come to our ballet center um, and really see if this is something I think she wants to do. And obviously, um, Misty went on from there as the principal uh, dancer for American Ballet Theater, world, you know, world renowned as yes. African American. You have stories like that, you know, doctors, nurses, um, lawyers, uh, Councilman Buscaino is a, an alumnus of the club. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have, uh, like myself, have been fortunate to come through the club and uh, be able to go on to, um, to meeting some of our goals and aspirations. These are young people who um, don't have some of the privilege and some of the built-in pathways because of the, their family situations or, um, you know, obviously right now uh, we're finally dealing with racism and other issues that have been part of our, the history of our country and our communities for a long time. Uh, these kids haven't had a lot of the opportunities others have been born into. So this organization and other nonprofits like it are truly, you know, bringing equity and access, mm -hmm. I think, which is, that's all we're asking. Um, let's provide them with the same opportunities, the same access, um, and leveling the playing field so these, our kids, can compete in higher education, they can compete in the workplace, they can compete in a corporate boardroom, um, and they are. So that's, that's what we're trying to do, and um, I just, I thank you and everybody else for um, showcasing what we're doing, and uh, we, we're, we're looking for, uh, I think we're at, let's see, we're at 83 years, um, looking for our 100th anniversary uh, a little bit down the line. Good morning. My name is Rosa Pacinthi. I'm a proud member of the board of the Boys and Girls Club of Los Angeles Harbor. Um, I had the privilege of joining the club back in 2013, um, all because my son was getting ready to go off to college and my husband and I were becoming empty nesters. So the timing was perfect. I've always been a child advocate. I've always enjoyed doing things with kids at college. I've done a lot of on-campus interviews over the years, speaking engagements, mentoring. So when the opportunity came up, um, a mutual friend introduced me to the club, took me on a tour, and like most people, I was overwhelmed and significantly impressed when I walked through the club and found out what was going on here. I'm currently standing in one of our most important rooms as far as this is our benchmark program. This is the college-bound room. Um, this houses, and we have case managers that work with our college-bound students. Most of our kids, if not many of them, are the first in their families to go to college. So this room invests from the time that they start ninth grade, they're assigned a case manager, and they start working with the kids to make sure that they get all their credits and everything that's necessary to make sure that they get them into the university of their choice. So if you look around, this is um, 
our benchmark, benchmark program such that it has been emulated across the country and rolled out in a lot of the Boys and Girls Club across the country. Every year we graduate about 600 students and our graduation rate is extremely effective. We have about 97-98% of the kids that come through the College Bound program end up graduating and going on to either a two or four year university. And now in the last couple of years we've also invested a great deal in a program called Career Bound because we found that some kids want to go directly into the workforce or have a need to go directly into the workforce. So we're balancing our involvement, our staff, to support the college-bound program, which will always be our benchmark program, but now also the uh, career-bound program. There's a program that I'm personally involved in that it's one that I chair, which is the Youth of the Year program. And it gives me an opportunity to really work with community members a lot from Rancho Palos Verdes. We've had a lot of members in the community come in and actually judge our kids for the national recognition program. We end up identifying the member of the year to represent our organization. So a lot of people from the Palos Verdes community come in as judges and help us do that job. So it's an opportunity to introduce what we do to people in the community. And just like me, seven years ago, when they walk through the doors and get to meet these kids, they're in complete amazement as how unbelievable um, these kids are working to create a better future. So I first became a college bound member uh, my junior year and I started coming here for academic support, uh, for tutoring and uh, academic advising. Um, and then my senior year, I was able to apply to colleges and I decided on UCLA as my top choice. So I went off to continue my higher education and got my degree from UCLA. This program, College Bound, my mentors, my case managers were the ones that believed in me. And as the youngest of seven, I was able to go and make my dream of going to UCLA a reality um, because of the program and because of the mentorship and the guidance that I received. And uh, once I finished and received my degree, I uh, was able to come back and pay it forward. I think uh, the relationship that we're able to build with our students, um, we definitely get to connect with them, their family, their parents, um, when we help them understand that idea of higher education. I, like many of them, were the first in my family, so when I tell them that I get it, um, I, I think they understand that. Um, and we're able to relate in so many ways, uh, culturally and with our backgrounds, uh, even with language barriers. You know, I share my story with them all the time. Um, and I think they're able to connect with us that way. Um, and we really have, um, our goal is, uh, has always been to have them have a plan after high school. And that plan could be anything for them, whether the two year trade, vocational, or a uh, four year institution. So we built our first teen center back in 1999. And after two years, um, I was sitting in my corner office here, and I looked out the window at about 11.30, and I saw a group of my teens walking to school. So why are they walking to school at 11.30 in the morning? So I asked my teen director, do me a favor, check up on all of our teens and let me know how they're doing academically. I know we're doing after school tutoring and such. Let's see if they're really on the pathway. And I found out less than half of them were gonna graduate. Even though we had this teen center, we had tutoring. I happened to be on the school board with LAUSD at the same time, and so I brought educators down and said, okay, this isn't enough. Our kids aren't getting the extra help uh, that they need. They're not getting the classes they need to be college eligible. I said, we need to build a different program. So we built our own case management-based program where kids had one-on-one -on -one, uh, college coaches, just like, again, a kid up on the, you know, a family up on the hill will pay thousands of dollars for their child to have a college coach. Our kids couldn't afford that, so we were going to provide it. And that first year, we had 30 kids in that program. Um, I think that we had four seniors and one went to college. And uh, just this year, we had uh, over 1,600 uh, members in the program, 650 of them seniors who graduated, and 95% of those will go on to college, um, secure over $9 million in uh, federal aid and scholarships. So it's not just getting them to college, it's preparing them, um, having them ready to compete in college, having the resources to actually go to college. So it's, it's, a, it's a true pathway and multi-resourced program. It's our most expensive program we do. We're in, we have four college-bound centers in our different cl clubs, and we're in six high schools locally in the school in their college and career center providing those services there too. So it's, um, it's truly grown and it's, it's made a huge difference. You know, you just graduated from uh, Palos Verdes Peninsula High School. Congratulations. Just talk about how you got connected here at the Boys and Girls Club. 
Um, here I got connected by, I just came here because my brother needed to come here to just do something I think, do something um, community service wise and here was the best opportunity for him because they offer so many programs including college classes, um, free recording studio sessions, free dinners, um, free volunteer work. So there are so many opportunities, endless actually. And then my mom suggested that I come here, so I was like, okay, I'll come. And so I came and I first started enrolling in college classes and I've really started to get connected with many people here as well as get involved in tutoring and volunteer work. Are you sure a day in the life when you would come here and get mentored, like what, what would happen in, that, in the classroom to help you become a stellar student? In here? Yeah. Um, what I would do is I would first sign in, I would take, actually take the bus um, all the way to Western and Pedro, because and, I couldn't drive back then. And then my mom would drive me down here every day. Poor mom, but thank you mom. Um, <laughs> she would always drive me down here, and the first thing I would do, I, was do, I would do college classes. If I didn't do college classes, I would volunteer. I would um, give free vocal lessons to students that needed help in musical theater, auditions, you name it, I would help them out. Um, if I was free one day, I would take a free dance class. I would always take advantage of everything they had here. My plan is to just go to Santa Barbara Community College. Since I couldn't get into UCSB, I wanted to take still advantage of going to Santa Barbara, but doing it a cheaper way. So I found dorms right by uh, UCSB, like literally right across the street, you could just walk there. And I enrolled in Santa Barbara Community College. Here with Christina, you're gonna give us a quick tour. Right now we're in the lounge where the high school kids come. So what kinds of, uh, well, explain the facilities here for the high school kids that come here. So the high school kids, um, one of the main components, the reason they come here is because of our college bound um, center. So they can kind of learn how to do applications. They can have access to financial aid help. They can do different workshops and things like that. Um, when they're not in college bound, they have access to our arts academy, which is music, art. They can learn how to play instruments. They have access to our green screen, our studio, um, learning how to do um, like Photoshop, Illustrator, mixing things, stuff like that. When the middle schoolers come in, the first thing they do is they go to our learning center. Center. They get tutoring, homework help. Um, they make sure their homework's done, um, stuff like that. They get case managers for academic support. So whatever they're kind of lacking, if they need help in math or whatever, our case managers will be able to really kind of pinpoint exactly what they need help with. And then once they're done with that, they have access to um, our arts academy, our music, our studio, our um, robotics room, which is really cool. They can 3D print in there. I feel like for the elementary kids, there's a lot of leadership building as well. So we have our Smart Girl program, our Passport to Manhood, and they can kind of go and learn kind of how to interact with each other from a really young age. And they kind of are already exposed to our college bound program as well and Arts Academy, things like that. So it, all of our programs we offer K through 12, um, and it just is catered to age group depending on how deep we get into certain subjects and things like that. We're at the club check-in table with one of the chiefs here. How's it going? It's going well. It's going well. We're just excited to see the kids and hoping that they all want to come back. So, and of we'll course, you're taking all these safety precautions. Everyone is still worried about the COVID-19 and spreading it. So, what are you doing here? So, of course, when the kids come back, we have to make sure we're checking the temp as we're checking the temp of all the staff and employees that come in through the building, or actually everyone comes to the building. So, every day the kids will be getting their temperature checked, and they are getting a mask while they're attending the orientation. So, we have to make sure that they're taking the same precautions as we are taking as we're going into the building. You love being here. You've been here for five years. Talk about what you do. So originally I started teaching elementary um, art. I moved on to doing middle school and high school, but with this experience, um, I'm gonna be teaching elementary all the way to high school for the summer. You're excited to be back at summer camp. Tell me what you wanna do here. I wanna come back, have fun in the boys girls club. It's gonna be exciting to have fun and also to be back with kids because you probably haven't got to hang out with too many kids because of the pandemic, right? Yes. So tell me, you've been coming here for a long time. Tell me some of the things you get to do and why, you know, you just like being here. I just like being here, have, having, um, spending time with my friends, playing with my friends in the game, in the game. Doesn't everybody want to be a club kid? So much fun happening here. If you want more information, you can just log on to bgclaharbor.org. I'm Liz Brown Swanson with Around the Peninsula. Thanks for watching. Happy and safe summer, everyone.